Okay, so how we understand how river ecosystems work, um, this was kind of all put together into what's called the river continuum concept. And so as you move from the mountains down to the mouth of a river, things change in very predictable ways. So as you move downstream, you tend to see discharge increase, increasing. So how much water is moving past a given point um, over a period of time increases. Rivers carry more and more water as more and more tributaries contribute to their flow. Channel width tends to increase. Channel depth tends to increase. Um, and interestingly, the bed material size decreases. So up in the mountains, you have these big boulders and rocks. And then you end up having smaller cobbles and pebbles. And then near the mouth of the river, it turns into silt and sand and really fine um, material sizes. The other thing that decreases as you move downstream is slope. So you end up with really steep slopes at the mountain. And then as, as you get closer to the ocean, the slope flattens out. And then um, sediment storage increases. So rivers tend to be erosional at the top, and then they start to be depositional. They're depositing material in the floodplain. And so they're storing sediment in, across their broad floodplain at the bottom. The thing that's interesting is that the velocity of a given water molecule does not change that much. So you have really fast velocities at the top in the mountains. Um, you have really fast velocities in the middle ranges. And then because so much water is moving at the bottom, the velocity is still pretty fast. So velocity doesn't change much at all. Um, although certain parts of the stream might have faster flows for some reason, like the Thalweg, which is always the area of fastest flow. So other things change as you move downstream, like the communities and sources of lochthinous and autochthonous energy and the types of fish that you might find. So we'll talk about each of these sections in more detail. So up at the headwaters, you tend to have narrow, shallow, shaded, steep streams. You have allochthonous inputs outweighing algal growth. And so your photosynthesis to respiration ratio tends to be less than one, your net heterotrophic stream. You're dominated by shredders and collectors with about 15% predators and mainly have cold water fish like trout, minnows, and sculpins. Then moving into the mid reaches, you have more sunlight, wider streams, warmer water, and you're more dominated by autochthonous inputs of algae. You have, because of this, you have a P to R ratio that's greater than one. So your net autotrophic um, system for the most part. You're dominated by collectors and grazers, again, with about 15% predators. And your fish, you might have more generalists like trout, minnows, and perch. And then in the large river, you have soft, slow flowing, sorry. Sorry about that. Large rivers, you have slow flowing water, increased turbidity, um, which reduces periphyton growth, although you might have some phytoplankton that start to grow. And again, because the water is so deep, your productivity to respiration ratio goes heterotrophic, so less than one. And in this case, collectors dominate fine particular organic matter that's produced upstream. It's almost all that you have, but you still have about 15% predators. And the fish transition to warm water suckers like carp, chub, catfish. And this is the only place in the river where you might have a significant amount of phytoplankton and zooplankton in a very large river. So of course, like any model, the river continuum concept isn't always perfect. Um, and certain things like man-made alterations um, can cause changes to the river continuum. So things like dams in particular will reset the continuum. So you might have a big river, you put a dam in, and all of a sudden just a little trickle of cold water comes out of the bottom of the dam, all of a sudden that stream is more like a headwater stream than a big river, right? So then you kind of get a reset of the continuum. Um, things like logging in headwaters, all of a sudden you don't have shaded cool, cool water reaches and there's a lot of light that reaches the bottom of the stream. Now you have, you know, autochthonous headwaters if you've logged your headwaters. Things like tropical streams and really short streams um, tend not to have very many shredders at all. Um, agricultural streams that have no canopy cover, even at the headwaters, this is challenging to the river continuum concept. 
and desert streams tend to be more influenced by temperature than any other factors. Um, and there's not a lot of riparian growth in some desert streams. So there have been some criticisms of the river continuum concept, and those, but those criticisms have led us to understanding rivers in new ways. So the, you know, people who put forward the flood pulse concept had problems with the river continuum, and that helped us to understand floodplains better. Um, the, um, there's some people who've worked on trying to understand how in-channel production in higher order rivers works. And so then we have the riverine productivity model. Um, the role of dams resulted in what's called the serial discontinuity concept. Um, understanding the role of hyperreic zones in rivers helped us to formulate what's called the hyperreic corridor concept. Um, sometimes tributaries can come in and affect the continuum. And so this is called the link discontinuity, discontinuity concept. The importance of different geomorphic processes and disturbance led to the process domain concept. So there's, there's just all of these kind of theoretical ways of thinking about rivers. Um, and then of course, disturbances um, influencing structure of streams led to all of these different um, concepts. So what do we know about the hyperreic zone? So the hyperreic zone is this saturated zone um, of flowing water. You just can't see it because it's underground. Um, it's basically saturated gravel that um, resides underneath the water, um, the, the water and provides really important habitat for early instars of aquatic insects. Um, there, this water flows much slower. It's going through interstitial spaces between rocks and grains of sand, and it flows up and down into the river channel, providing cool water to streams, kind of refrigerating them over time. And then um, if you dig down into the stream sediment underneath streams, you can find um, lots and lots of aquatic insects in their early, in their early forms. And if you want to learn more, there's a video posted on the module. So real briefly, here's um, the flood pulse concept. So basically this idea that floods will import nutrients, suspended solids, um, will increase productivity of floodplain forests, increase decomposition rates. Um, you're gonna have then as waters flow back into the stream, these lower dissolved organic, um, sorry, sorry, dissolved oxygen contents run off of nutrients resulting from decomposition. Um, and then you have the, this kind of increased productivity in both the um, terrestrial and the aquatic habitats. And that these flooded uh, forest habitats become really important habitat for fish. So to summarize, there's an exchange of nutrients, organisms, and organic material between the river and its floodplain. And that the timing of natural flooding often coincides with what fish need in terms of nurseries and um, brooding. These flooded terrestrial environments are really rich uh, habitats for young fish in particular, and that the flooding provides pulses of nutrients into riparian forests. So here's an image of the Willamette River um, outside of um, uh, the Willamette Valley, basically showing you these ghosts of uh, rivers past. So the bright white line is where the river is today. And the lighter colors of blue all around show you where the river used to be. And so this is this was um, determined using LIDAR satellite imagery. And um, what's really neat is a lot of these, um, these meander scars are no longer visible because they're underneath, you know, cropland and agriculture and um, little city developments and things, but you can see them using LIDAR and kind of patch them together. So it just shows us how dynamic rivers are, how much they move naturally, and uh, how dangerous it is to, you know, try to establish some kind of human settlement alongside a river that moves like this. So um, we can talk a little bit about reservoirs because they're kind of like rivers, kind of like lakes. Um, they tend to look like lakes, but they tend to have less surface area, um, but greater shoreline complexity than natural lakes. They have kind of a dendritic or tree-like shape because of course they're just a flooded river valley. And reservoirs provide really cold water releases from deep behind dams. They, they um, 
basically provide unnatural flow regimes. Um, they kind of minimize disturbances for downstream communities, which is good for humans, but bad for rivers. And they can starve the river of both sediment and organic material downstream. We can change dam management to benefit rivers by um, introducing high flow events, um, having flow events timed with things like cottonwood seedling establishment, uh, fish, you know, fish movement needs, things like that. Um, and here's an example of an experiment on the Colorado River where they in introduced these what are called bug flows, these really high flows um, that have a particular timing to them to allow for water to be high and then recede slowly and allow um, insects to lay their eggs in the wet mud and then allow enough time for those eggs to hatch to produce a lot of um, insects. And these insects then feed fish um, in the stream. So the hydropower dam on the Colorado River was resulting in basically the starving of, of the river ecosystem. There just wasn't enough um, production of, of insects in the stream or in the river to support uh, native and introduced fish habitat, fish populations. And so these bug flow experiments have been very successful. Okay, let's pause here.